It's a real pleasure to be here, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be uh, a partner with uh, AIR, and it's been great getting to know Jonathan and the team, and it's been great being here today when I wasn't fussing around in the back with equipment problems, seeing how much you all uh, care and how much thought you're putting in to your own work, and so that's really inspiring to me. Uh, we have a little bit of a, a self-control test, so hopefully nobody ate the jelly beans. If you did, uh, you're doomed to a life of failure, and you'll never reach your peak potential. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the science of human connection uh, with some implications for coaching and management, but I think that's where I will leave it to you. So I will give you some of the, you know, what we're learning about the ways in which our brains allow us to connect with other people. Essentially, what makes each of us tick the way we do? Uh, what makes some people tick differently from others? And in particular, for this, uh, this application, how do we get people to tick together a little bit uh, more effectively. So we're going to be looking under the hood today. And we'll start um, kind of where I, I think Tomas might have um, touched on this, but you know, one of the big data people analytics uh, kind of survey approaches to trying to understand what makes a good manager, what makes a good leader. So this is Google's Oxygen Project. Um, Adam Grant's been a part of this. It's 10 years in the making. And they, uh, based on lots and lots of data on um, uh, surveys, what, what employees said makes a good manager, they basically came to a bunch of you know, sort of eight different factors. But the key to all these is strong social skills, the ability to relate to others, the ability to communicate effectively. And that perhaps shouldn't be surprising because really, as human beings, we're all about being social. So more than really any other uh, animal species on the planet, we, our own destinies are linked to each other. So we have this amazing capacity and need to come together in groups to do things that we couldn't do on our own, like these guys putting up the new Comcast building in Philadelphia. That's a southeast Pennsylvania joke. This is Amish people raising a barn. <laughs> but it illustrates the point. <coughs> Cooperation, connection is key to human existence. And we now know uh, from lots of work uh, in medicine that people who have stronger connections with others live longer, healthier, happier lives. They also make more money. Okay, so this is a key feature of the Human Adaptive Toolkit. And if we look at the flip side of that, right, we're now in the middle of what's been called the epidemic of loneliness. Something like more than 50% of people, especially young people, uh, endorse the statement that they have felt really, really lonely in the past year. And we know that those feelings of lonely, loneliness are associated with physical pain. Okay, they actually feel physical pain. And this is associated with years off your lifespan. Okay, it's like taking up smoking being lonely. This is a terrible thing. It really illustrates the fact that how important social connection is to us as human beings. And if we look even further at disorders right, in which social connection is impaired, like autism or schizophrenia, right, you can really, really um, appreciate how important our ability to connect is. Now, this is so deeply wired into us. We are really wired to connect with others that we can't, most of us can't help but find social information rewarding and attention grabbing. So, you know, advertisers uh, have clued, in, clued into this a long time ago, over 100 years ago. If you put attractive or uh, high status people, celebrities, you just picture them next to a product and people are more likely to buy it. Okay, that's kind of weird, right? It has no impact on the effectiveness of that product or its utility for you, other than the fact that it happens to be sitting next to somebody, right, who, who's attractive or who's very famous. And in fact, this is so deeply wired into us, it's a part of our heritage as, as primates. And so we have studied <coughs> non-human primates. Monkeys actually share the exact same fascination we do with, um, with social uh, imagery. And we discovered that monkeys find it rewarding. They'll give up juice. They'll pay juice to see monkey celebrities and, and sexy monkeys, OK? And if you follow the logic, it should be clear that if that's true, we should be able to advertise to monkeys as well. And so we ran an experiment back when I was at Duke. Actually, an undergrad, undergrad led this. And we just did a social advertising campaign. Monkeys watch TV for about an hour a day, and they would see certain pictures like this is a sexy female monkey from behind. Um, monkeys tell us that. I'm not telling you that. Uh, and if you put it next to Adidas, OK, so this should, this should, this should uh, kind of rub off some high value on the Adidas logo. But, and you can't see it here. There's a, sorry, there's a, um, a scrambled version of that next to Nike. We did high status monkeys next to Acura, you know, low status next to Pizza Hut, et cetera. And then we just gave the monkeys choices between those brands. 
between those logos. There's no impact on the reward they get. They get food no matter what. And they develop very strong preferences for the brands that were advertised by sexy or powerful high-status monkeys. Okay, does that sound familiar? It's pretty remarkable. Okay, so we've all been, we've been talking about the fact that relationships are key to business. They're really key to effective working teams. And to illustrate that um, principle a little bit more uh, directly from my own experience, when I was a kid growing up, I was 13 years old, 1980 uh, Olympics. At that time, uh, Olympic teams were supposed to be amateurs. Okay, uh, and that was certainly true in the US. There were other teams like the, the Soviet uh, men's hockey team. They were really professionals. They were the best team in the world. They had the best athletes. They trained together all year round. They were essentially paid. And when the time came for the Olympics, uh, we had to put together a team, right, and out of nowhere, out of a bunch of college kids. And so the, the US Olympic Committee hired this guy, Herb Brooks. I don't know if you've seen the movie, Miracle on Ice. But um, when uh, Herb was basically trained as a psychologist, and he used uh, Myers-Briggs, you know, as many, problematic as that is, to try to psychologically profile potential players. And he also took, uh, took players who had played together on the same teams, so they had some degree of trust and, and nonverbal working communication with each other. You know, and the, long story short, uh, the, the, men's, the US men's team goes out and beats the Soviet Union and takes the gold medal. Okay, they weren't the better they weren't the better athletes, they weren't the better hockey players, but they were the better team, right? They worked better together. So how are we supposed to actually go ahead and understand what makes a good team player? What makes a person effective at working with others and communicating with others? Traditionally, the approach has been to use surveys, psych psychometric instruments, ask people questions on a scale of one to 10, how social are you? On a scale of one to 10, how much empathy do you have, right? And we know that, um, Surveys like this, asking people questions is limited because we only have access to a very small sliver of the chatter of the 80 to 100 billion neurons that are active in our own brains, right? We, most of that does not raise to the level of consciousness that we can actually express. And even if it does, we're not so ready to tell you the truth about it, right? So people can game surveys, they can game questionnaires, okay? Or their responses can be biased depending on what they think you want. Okay, so if we want to do a better job, we need to develop some more effective tools. And so my proposition to you is to go beyond psychology. Let's go to neuroscience. Let's look at the source of all of that information, right? The three and a half pounds of meat and fat between your ears. That's what it really is. Uh, this is the source of every thought that you've ever had, every connection you've ever made with another individual, every memory, everything you've ever learned. This is not trivial, okay? So there are 80 to 100 billion neurons in your brain making about 100 trillion connections with each other. Okay, so this is the most complex device in the known universe. And I think you know, many of my colleagues uh, at Penn and elsewhere, if I were to say that, oh, I'm going to tell you uh, how we can use neuroscience to make your job better, make you more effective at your job, they'd say, that's crazy. You can't do that. We can't even understand how a cubic millimeter of your retina at the back of your eye uh, senses light. And I would say that's true if you're trying to understand every single biochemical, you know, um, movement of molecules, et cetera. We don't have an understanding at that level that I can relate to you that would help you to, to help teams be more effective. But over the last 20 years, advances in neuroscience, in particular uh, new non-invasive technologies that allow us to see the human brain in action while it's doing its job, have allowed us to uncover the kind of, and sketch out the basic circuitry that's involved. Right. And so this has put us in a position to really say this is what makes uh, this circuitry more effective, more potent, and this is how you can put this into practice. Now, in order to do that, you have to understand something about the technology that's uh, available. So the kind of gold standard would actually be to listen to these neurons directly, these cells. And to do that, you have to put a probe in your brain. Okay? How many people want to have that done right now? <laughs> Elon Musk aside. So he, you know, he's really into that. You'd rather take a survey. Um, so this is not that, uh, this is the gold standard, but you know, it's not very useful uh, in your daily practice, right? And so that's, for that reason, you would turn to other kinds of technologies that are non-invasive, like brain imaging. Most of you, if you have any uh, kind of experience with neuroscience, it's gonna be pretty pictures of lights on a brain. This is fantastic. This allows you to test hypotheses about uh, and identify the key players in the circuits. But there are some limitations with this as well because you know, brain imaging, let's face it, is super expensive. You've got to go to an academic medical center, costs $1,000 an hour. 
uh, to run with, to, to get data on an individual, right? And you can't put one on your head and walk around um, you know, as a member of a team, at least not right now. And so that means that we have to turn to other kinds of more scalable technologies like electroencephalograms, EEG. You put electrodes on the outside of the scalp, really easy in a guy like me, more difficult than some of the other people here who are, continue to have hair on their heads. Um, but this gives you a kind of real-time running data on kind of what your brain is doing and can give us insights into key processes related to attention and arousal and reward and decision making and in particular social connection. We can also then look at other kinds of technologies that perhaps might at first glance not seem to uh, tell us much about what's going on in the brain. So for example, eye tracking is one of the most compelling and useful techniques uh, in neuroscience as applied to business and that's because you can only see really clearly the width about the width of your thumb at arm's length and so we have to move our eyes around to gather information to guide our behavior. Most of us are completely unaware of that uh, and when it's happening because our brain stitches this together in a seamless way. But where we're looking then betrays what's going on in our head, right? What processes are intervening between what we see and what we do. And you get a little bit of a freebie with eye tracking because you get a measure of the size of the pupil and the size of the pupil is related to a couple of really important chemicals in your brain, namely dopamine, which is associated with reward, and norepinephrine, which is the brain's adrenaline chemical, which is, we know is intimately tied to how exploratory you might be or how creative you might be at that moment. And we can even turn to other technologies which at first glance seem to have nothing to do with the brain, okay, which we'll see in a minute, hopefully, or in about half an hour, uh, if this works out, like heart rate. So our heart rates, we're all collecting data on our heart rates right now through uh, wearable technology, Fitbits, Apple Watches, et cetera. And heart rate tells you something about your, level, your activity level and how fit you are. But it turns out that heart rate is also shaped by what you're thinking. So if you're more aroused, right, if you are more anxious, your heart rate goes up. And as I'll show you, if you measure heart rate in two or more people simultaneously, they will show synchrony in their heart rates, okay? That is a function of how, uh, how much trust they have with each other and how well they are working together. Okay, and this is an extraordinary discovery um, that uh, we don't understand a lot of the, the basic mechanics of, but we can apply it um, in the here and now. Okay, so to kind of get now after, <laughs> with that introduction underway, uh, let's uh, go back and think about how we connect with others and really a major discovery in the last 15 years in neuroscience is that we have a circuit in our brains, which is often called the social brain network, which is specialized to manage our connections with others. Okay, and it begins with an appreciation of sensory decoding at the back of the brain of who's around us. Are you somebody familiar or not? What's your identity? It tells us something about your emotional state by reading your uh, facial expressions and your movements. And from there, information is basically piped to two parts of the brain that are really important for working with others. One is involved in empathy, that is understanding the internal uh, emotional experience of another individual. And the other set of brain areas is involved in something we call theory of mind or mentalizing. And that is forming a model in your head of what's going on in somebody else's head at a cognitive level. Are they somebody who's trustworthy, right? Are they going to help me, right? Do they see, do they have the same goals as I do? Okay, and those two processes come together and ultimately guide behavior. And so we're going to now take a tour through these various steps in the functioning of the social brain network. And so as a first exercise, now you guys have been doing this all day, but I'm just gonna ask you for 30 seconds to mingle with each other, the people at your table if you haven't talked to them. Go ahead. Say hello. Tell each other, <clears throat> this is a really great talk, this is crappy talk, whatever. I know it's gonna be impossible to get you guys to stop now, right? You can't help it, it's rewarding. Okay, let's go, let's get, let's, Okay, let's come back. Attention up front again. I know it's really, really hard, and you've become good friends today. So what you were just doing there was exercising your social brain network, and we now know that differences between people in the health and integrity of their social brain network, literally how big it is and how, how well-wired it is, those, that predicts the number and depth of friends that you actually have. Okay, in the real world, 
And at least 10 years ago, it predicted how many friends you had online. Now we know that that whole system is corrupt and there are bots and all kinds of things going on. But uh, it, this, is, this is something that's really extraordinary, right? So if you have a better functioning social brain network, you're going to have a better functioning real human social network. Now that raises a big question. Is this something you can change or is it destiny? So we know in the limit in terms of pathology that people who are born with certain disorders are going to have differences in their social brain networks, which limits or impairs their ability to connect with others. But we now know that the social brain network is like a muscle, okay? And the more you use it, the bigger and healthier and stronger it gets. And the, the critical studies were done, sorry, the animation didn't work. The critical studies can't be done in humans, but they've been done in monkeys. Monkeys basically have the same social brain network in their heads that they depend on to make connections with others. And in a study that was done at Oxford, now there's been several studies, and in fact, we've replicated one of them. You take monkeys who are living alone, you scan their brains to measure the size and integrity of their social brain network. Now you put them into different size groups. Some monkeys have to learn how to live with one other monkey, some four, some seven. This has now been expanded up to something like 32. And you say, live together, get along, find a way to be friends uh, for the next three months. Now you bring them back in, you scan their brains, and what you find is that this is literally the thickness of the gray matter in a key part of the social brain network scales linearly with how many monkeys you had to figure out how to get along with. Okay, and these are not baby monkeys, these are adult monkeys. Okay, so we're seeing strong brain plasticity. It's basically use it or lose it, the social brain network is like a muscle, so what, you know, one take home message from this is that you know, at the end of the long week, how do you, what do you do next? What do you do to relax? Do you go sit, go sit at home and binge watch uh, your favorite TV show on Netflix? If you do, you might be depriving your social brain network of an ability to go out and exercise. So I always say to people, on the weekend, even though you're not at work, get out, go to the farmer's market, go play volleyball, whatever it is that, you know, company picnic, interact with people, and when you're doing that, you're building your social brain. When you come back to work on Monday, you're gonna be more effective. Maybe not just from that weekend's worth of work, but this is something you can exercise, it's something you can do uh, to make yourself more effective. So now we're gonna turn to, um, the next uh, uh, kind of exercise. And now we're gonna get to the jelly beans. So there are two, uh, each, each of you has a, a tub in front of you, uh, either green top or yellow top. Okay, and this is a nonverbal exercise. And I'm gonna say the people with the green, and this is, this is just random, the people with the green tops select a jelly bean and eat it, and the other people are gonna go second. Okay, so people with the green tops, go ahead and choose one. Everybody try one? Everybody try one? I'm not, well, we'll go over that later. Okay, did all the green, the green tops try them? Okay, now yellow tops, you go. Sorry, I should be on TV. Everybody, did everybody, did, uh, <coughs> I heard somebody coughing over there. Um, did everybody try one? Okay, so in the first group, the green group, how many people got a bad tasting jelly bean? Okay, good, that's great. That should be half, there shouldn't be any bias. How about in the second group, did anybody get a bad tasting jelly bean? Okay, you guys need some work. Um, so, so the key here is, <coughs> is attention, right? So all the information you would need to understand what's the good tasting jelly bean or the bad tasting jelly bean is provided by your partners who are consuming them, if they eat something that tastes bad, they're gonna make a universal sign of bitterness. It's found across all animals, okay? And, this, and it's a signal that we, we spontaneously pick up on and we learn from that, we know what's good and what's bad to eat. Monkeys never fail this test, okay? I've given monkeys this test, they don't fail it. But you guys, you know, again, <laughs> you, you need some work. And I think part of the problem is that, you know, what you pay attention to, what you're looking at, is gating the information that goes into the social brain network. If you're not looking, if your eyes are closed, it has no data to work on. Okay, so if you guys spend a lot of your time like this, okay, if you've got your phone, you've got your device out under the table, you think you're hiding it from people, but you're kind of <laughs> looking down, you are not getting the data. You are depriving your social brain of the information it needs, that it evolved right, to use to make estimates of other people to understand their experience and to get along with them. So pay attention to everybody, please. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you a couple of videos. 
They're going to take us on this sort of next journey from attention and perception to, um, to another feature of human social cognition. Okay, some of you may have seen this first video, okay, by Heider and Simmel. It was made in the 1940s. Has anybody seen this? If you're, if you're psychology, you have training psychology, you've probably seen it. So I'm just going to ask you to watch the video. We may need to turn down the lights on the next couple of videos and just, just watch it and, um, you know, and then I'll ask you what you see. There we go. Anybody see a story there, a social narrative, right? It's amazing, right? We, we can't help it. We, we, our brains are tuned to find social narratives, to find intentions, even when there none exist. I mean, these are just, this is just geometry, right? And yet, when you watch something like this, you're, the parts of your social brain that are involved in decoding intentions from the movements of other individuals are actually active. And the more active your brain is in response, the social brain in response to seeing even something abstract, the more likely you are to give to charity or to be pro-social to somebody who needs help. I mean, that's unbelievable to me. It's amazing. Okay, now I'm gonna show you another video. I'm just gonna take this a step further. And I don't know if there's, let's see how this, how we do with the lights. Okay, cool. <laughs> Many of you feel bad for this lamb. That is because you're crazy. It has no feelings, and the new one is much better. <coughs> so, 
This is a really fabulous commercial. It was actually directed by Spike Jones, so you know he's a famous Hollywood director. He does something really remarkable here. You know, let's forget the music, which is very helpful, but he creates this sense of empathy, right? You feel really sad for the lamp, and, and why do you feel sad for the lamp? What's that? It's been replaced, for sure. But the other thing that Spike Jones does in this, which is very clever, is to create some perspective taking. So he shoots it as if you are kind of in the place of the lamp, right? And this is sort of fundamental. Another fundamental aspect of how we understand others is by taking their perspective. It's something that emerges early in infancy, somewhere between six months and a year of age. And the first phase of that is looking at someone like a caregiver, and when she turns and looks at something, you follow her gaze, okay? That is one of the first things. It's the first identifiable marker, behavioral marker of autism, okay, in a child who, who will go on to have difficulties connecting with another individual. Monkeys follow the gaze of other monkeys. So this is really, a, again, a very fundamental component of how we relate to other people. And what's really remarkable is we now know that power shapes the way our social brains relate to others and our, the way that we, or our ability to take the perspective of others. So one of the first studies that I know of that examined this was a purely behavioral study by my colleague Maurice Schweitzer um, at, uh, at Wharton and also Adam Galinsky at NYU. And in this uh, study, they asked people basically, they did a bunch of different manipulations, but they asked people to, without thinking, just write the letter E on their forehead. Okay, and if people were primed to be thinking they were in a position of power or if they actually were powerful people within their organization, they would end up writing the letter E so that they could see it themselves. <clears throat> Whereas if they had been primed to be in a low power position, they would write the letter E so it would be uh, legible by somebody else, so from that other person's perspective. Okay, so power is shaping that, and we know now, from now there are probably about a half dozen brain imaging studies which show that um, basically the activity in your social brain network goes down as your perceived status goes up, as your power goes up. So uh, here's from one study by, uh, uh, that, uh, by my uh, colleague Emily Falk uh, at the Annenberg School of Communication, um, as well as Matt Lieberman out at UCLA. And here what's, what's displayed is for each individual who's in the study, they rate themselves on a ladder, okay, with eight being kind of highest ranking within their organization. You can see that activity within these parts of the social brain network goes down systematically with increasing uh, belief in your own power or status. And this has now been demonstrated at Dartmouth amongst undergraduates and a few other different studies. So this suggests that when we are high status, when we're powerful, when there's a real hierarchy uh, in place, the people at the top tend not to pay attention to anybody else. If you don't pay attention to somebody else, you're not gonna, you're not gonna have any activity in your social brain network. You're not gonna take perspective, their perspective. You're not gonna develop empathy. This is so, again, I just re, you know, I'm gonna emphasize this again. This is so hard wired in that we find this in monkeys too. So monkeys follow the gaze of other monkeys. They take their perspective. But it's only the low status monkeys that really do that. They follow everybody's gaze. They take the perspective of everybody because they're trying to figure out what's going on. And high status monkeys, they don't care. Right. They only follow the gaze. They only take the perspective of other high-status monkeys. So this is, you know, it's, again, it's, it's exactly what we see in people, okay? And it tells us this is a 20, 28 million year old uh, process. It's in our brains. It's going to take some real uh, hard work to overcome that. Okay, so now I'm going to show you, I'm gonna, we're going to move on to the next step in this process of sort of perception and attention, uh, perspective taking, and, and I'm going to ask you something about how you feel. I'm going to show you a couple of videos. Okay, and after them, I'll, I'll, after I show you them to you, I'll ask you how you felt. So here's one. Okay, you ready? Okay. There was some, something expressed here. Here's another one. Okay. So how do people feel about that? Not good? Bad? You feel that person's pain, right? You feel some empathy for them? So you, it probably did not escape your notice that there were the two women were from different uh, ethnicities, right? And so <clears throat> this is a study that was done by a postdoc of mine, but back when he was a, a PhD student in China. And he was looking at <clears throat> the, the, uh, how our brains process information about people from other ethnic groups, other races. And he uh, was capitalizing on the fact that um, there's a part of your social brain network in, the, in kind of right here, if you were to intersect my two fingers, that's active when, not only when we feel pain or pleasure, but when somebody else feels pain or pleasure. And we know that the strength of that activity predicts how likely you would be to help that person. So in this study, 
And basically, they brought in, he brought in uh, women and men who were either ethnically Caucasian or ethnically Chinese. And they watched these videos, and then they had their brain scanned, okay? And he asked them, how did you feel? And everybody said, I felt really bad for that person. I felt pain. But their brains told a different story, okay? So here's this part of the social brain network involved in, um, in empathy. Chinese observer, or observers, sorry, watching a Chinese woman's face apparently pierced with a needle. Also, by the way, nobody was hurt. These are fake needles that go back up into the syringe. So big brain empathy response, watching a Caucasian woman's face uh, pierced with a needle, nothing, okay? And vice versa for Caucasian observers. Big uh, brain empathy response for a Caucasian uh, woman's face being pierced, but nothing for the Chinese woman. Okay, this is horrible, right? <clears throat> this is like, oh my God, what are we gonna do with this? Even when we think we feel something, our brains are doing something else. They're processing that information about another individual in a very different way. <clears throat> and um, I'm gonna tell you that it's not all bad. It turns out that this is something that can be changed the, and that can be changed by what you emphasize. If I touch, if I use your finger to touch her nose synchronously as you're feeling touching on your own nose, your brain is trying to put this together. I feel like I'm touching my nose, but my arm's out here. So how does your, what does your brain interpret that as? Well, my nose must have grown out to here. So people start to feel their nose growing out until it's like the length of their arm. It's really bizarre, called the Pinocchio illusion. Um, so let's see, so that's our brain creating a sense of ourself, our body in space. And you can now start to play tricks on your brain. So there's another version of this called the rubber arm illusion. You put a rubber arm on the table, you put your arm under the table or next to it, you stroke your arm, somebody strokes your arm while you're seeing one of these rubber arms stroked and you start to feel like it's your arm. Like if somebody brings out a hammer, like they're gonna hit it, you shriek. <clears throat> if you make the rubber arm have a different skin tone from your own, then you start to actually feel differently about people with, with a different skin color. Okay, you see implicit attitudes go down, implicit racial bias, and the most effective way of doing this, this is an, a, a, an approach called infacement, where you sit in front of a, what looks like a mirror, but it's a computer screen, and you have your own face touched with a cotton swab. At the same time, you see somebody in the quote unquote mirror, their face being touched with a cotton swab, and your, fa your brain is trying to put two and two together. <clears throat> your brain says, oh, this is me, okay? And you begin to kind of see people from other ethnic groups, other races, as being more attractive. You show um, lower implicit bias on, on implicit bias tests. It's not clear this lasts forever, right? This lasts for the 10 minutes or so of the experiment, but it's very, very intriguing because it says, suggests that there's something about the way our brains create a sense of identity, right, that could potentially be exploited, right, to create some more inclusiveness uh, amongst people, and that could be done on teams. So let's now go, now go back to that empathy question, okay? Right, no brain empathy for somebody from a different ethnic group. However, we know that there are times and places where we come together uh, as people from all different walks of life, different uh, ethnic groups, different, um, you know, dif different socioeconomic classes, different parts of the city, like so here's a Philadelphia Eagles game at the link, and Everybody's getting along, and you see all these people with green shirts on. They put on green shirts, and even though they're all very different, they put on green shirts, and now they're ready to fight people with blue shirts on. <laughs> the giants. Okay, this is ridiculous. Why in the world would that happen? And it happens so quickly. It's because now you're emphasizing the fact that we're on a team, right? And that's the real key here. And you can do something very, very minimal to emphasize teamwork and shared goals uh, as opposed to the differences uh, between us. And in fact, uh, my postdoc back again for his PhD um, showed that basically you bring people into the lab <clears throat> and you have them put on a red shirt or a blue shirt. It's just a minimal group uh, type treatment uh, that's been around in psychology since the 1960s. And then the women in those videos are either wearing a red shirt or a blue shirt. And you tell your participants, oh, if the, per if the woman in is wearing the same shirt as you, you're gonna be on the same team later for some, some exercise you have to do. And what you find is if, um, if the woman's on the opposite team, you get that same blunting effect, right? No empathy for somebody from another race, but now they're on the same team, and that rescues that brain empathy response. Now your brain is treating that person more like an individual who shares your identity because now you're on the same team. So that's sort of leveled the playing field, right? It's put the emphasis on shared shared features at the expense of the things that are different. And so I think that, you know, a take home message from that, and it's something I know that you all do, is to try to do things, right, 
develop interventions that emphasize what's shared, you know, shared goals, shared membership on a team, et cetera. Okay, so now I want to turn to another demo, and hopefully this demo will work since we spent a lot of time uh, this afternoon <laughs> trying to make things work. And so I'm going to need two more victims, volunteers, um, to come up. I'm not going to touch your faces or your noses. Um, I'm going to ask you to put heart rate monitors on. Uh, they go on your ear, so I need two people. And with any luck, this will all work. Okay, do I have, um, are you, you're one of my victims. Awesome, oh, awesome. Do you guys know each other? Uh, nope. All right, so one of you stand on this side of the table. Okay, I'm just gonna clip this on your ear. Just get a good ear in there. But, and you're gonna come on this side of the table. And if you could flip up the, the here, come on over here, stand in front of her. Yeah, thanks. And I'm gonna put one on you. So you got two of you up there. Heart rates. <clears throat> and I'm gonna ask you to do something you might not have done for a long time. So don't worry, I want you to each start building your own vehicle, a car, together. Don't, don't watch, no, 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 on your own, sorry. Build one on your own, build one on your own. I, I thank you for pointing that out. So you can see that they're not quite aligned. All right, for the most part, although they're pretty aligned for people who don't know each other. Um, now I want you to start building one together without talking. And so what I see is them um, coming into stronger alignment. I mean, if you, this is something that um, we wouldn't just do as a display here. There's some very high-end analyses you have to do to get the phase trajectory of the, the two sets of heart rates. This is something that is, uh, to me, like a minor miracle that you can observe this. Um, I have done this with people from, say, special forces or SEAL team, you know, and these are guys whose lives depend on being in sync with each other, and they just go right into perfect alignment. Now, you, this is the hardest part. I have to ask you to sit down and stop playing with Legos so I can finish the... I know, it's so, once you get started, it's very, you get hooked on it, right? Thank you, no, thank you, that was really awesome. And um, <clears throat> so if we could go back, flip back to the slides. Um, this idea of kind of the harmonic resonance in physiology uh, goes back to some studies, uh, a study, in fact, that the earliest that I'm aware of, the study of firewalkers in Spain. Okay, so these are, uh, this is a kind of ritual that's performed all over the world. The whole town comes together. It's this big bonding event. They're walking across hot coals. And in this study, the scientists put heart rate monitors on the, heart, the firewalker as well as people in the crowd. Okay, and everybody's super excited. Um, you know, the, the crowd's kind of going wild. But what, what, the, what the scientists found is that people in the crowd who were the close family and friends of the firewalker, their heart rates went up and down in almost perfect time with the fire walker. And you didn't see that in other people in the crowd, despite the fact that everybody's excited, it's very highly arousing. So there's something, right, about that connection that allows our brains to not only be sensitive to and read out another individual's state, but our own emotional state, our own heart rates come to align with this. And this is actually generated by physiological synchrony that happens in the brain. Okay, so this is something we've been measuring, uh, in a, and I can tell you more about this, in a variety of different team applications. Uh, a really beautiful study came out about a year and a half ago. Uh, in this study, they put uh, wireless EEG monitors on a bunch of students uh, and teachers uh, in classrooms at Stuyvesant uh, High School, and then, uh, and then measured uh, synchrony in their brain activity. And what they found was those classrooms that had higher synchrony among students and with the teacher had better learning outcomes. They had more engagement, right? They had better retention. And this makes a lot of sense, right? Because a learning environment is a social environment. And if you're paying attention to each other, then potential, then your brains should be processing information in a very similar way in real time. And in fact, they did one more beautiful thing here, which was to uh, try to see what factors might actually predict the degree of synchrony that these um, classrooms would come into. And it was one thing okay, that really shaped that. And it was the amount of eye contact between students in the five minutes before class. As simple as that. 
Now, we don't know if that is an actual driver, right? Or that itself is a marker of the fact that they already have a strong connection. This is something we're really pushing and trying to understand at a very mechanistic level, as well as applications. Uh, so we're studying physiological synchrony in sports teams, for example, where the metrics in terms of performance are objective uh, and where a 2% improvement right, can be the difference between winning and losing. So um, I now want to turn to kind of a, a last bit of a section here in terms of things you can do to turn it up to 11 if you're a Spinal Tap fan, then hopefully you get the reference. So how can, how can we improve, how can we maximize, optimize uh, people's ability to connect with others? And there's a lot of potential ways. There's a lot of interest in this molecule. Does anybody know what this molecule is? This is oxytocin, right? A nine peptide molecule. It's produced in your hypothalamus. Um, and it's a very ancient molecule, okay? It's shared with all vertebrates, okay? All higher organisms on this planet. And oxytocin in mammals, in all of us, its primary function, right, is to uh, help build a strong bond between mothers and their babies. Okay, so oxytocin is released um, during childbirth. It's released uh, when you're nursing. Okay, so these are times when your baby would be right on you. And this uh, has, a, has a very important role in building that bond between mother and child. But we also know from work over the last 20 years or so that oxytocin is really important for other, it has been basically co-opted by evolution to help build other kinds of bonds between people. So we know that oxytocin is really important for building trust. We know oxytocin is important for um, attention to others. So if you actually snort oxytocin, which is a way to get it into your brain, it gets translocated along cranial nerves up into your brain, then it promotes eye contact, it promotes your ability, it increases your ability to uh, read other people's emotions, and it is currently being explored in you know, probably four dozen different clinical trials as a therapy for uh, improving social functions in disorders like autism, schizophrenia, social anxiety, uh, et cetera. And um, oxytocin is so, I mean, the, it's such a part of who we are that we've rubbed it off, we've selected for this system in other critters that we spend a lot of time with. So it turns out that uh, oxytocin, um, when you make uh, positive eye contact with your dog, uh, oxytocin is released uh, in you, okay, and also in your dog, uh, and that is, you know, partly responsible for the bond that you form with your dog, and this is another take home that I always say, if you, you know, so say you need to go to work and you've got to be at the top of your game in terms of ability to connect with others and trust, et cetera, ideally you'd, you know, have five minutes of eye contact with somebody before you go, but if you don't have somebody there or you're a little too anxious, grab a dog, uh, <laughs> look him in the eye, hopefully the dog's been fed, um, look them in the eye and you're going to, it's pre-gaming, right? So pre-game with your dog and you're going to have a, a higher functioning um, social brain network because we've shown that in fact if you put oxytocin into those spots in the brain that I showed you earlier, you have the same, it has the same impact as inhaling it. Okay, and one more word on oxytocin uh, and this is something that I don't quite know how to reconcile with kind of the current zeitgeist, which is that social touch is also a really, really important part of connecting with others, and it's mediated by the oxytocin system. It turns out we have sensors in our skin that are specialized for, the only thing they're specialized for is to sense the touch of another human being. They work best at body temperature, okay? Uh, they can't tell, they don't tell you much about where you're being touched or what kind of touch it is, other than that I'm being touched by a human being. These sensors, okay, go right into your brain and they promote the release of oxytocin. Uh, and so I think it's not a surprise that especially in, uh, in sports, right, you often see a lot of pro-social touch, and that's probably really important for the kind, it's not just that it feels good, it's actually releasing a substance in your brain that we know is important, is critical, right, for building strong trust and bonds with other individuals. And I mean, the final moment here, and I think we're miraculously about on time, I want to talk about, there's a whole bunch of ways in which you can send this thing off track, not turn it up to 11, but turn it back down to one. Um, and I'm going to uh, end with asking you a question, okay, which is what you had for breakfast today. Anybody want to volunteer um, what they ate? Come on. Yogurt. Yogurt, okay. Anybody else? What's that? 
Fiber one bar, I don't even know what's in that. Um, fiber, I guess. Uh, any, anybody else? Cere who said cereal? Awesome, you're, you're a plant. And it, fruit, great. Eggs, perfect, we've got the spectrum from, oof. Wow, you guys are really care about me, this is so nice. <laughs> it's very poorly placed. Uh, so, so we have the spectrum from high carb, cereal, fruit, to uh, high protein, and um, you know, it turns out that what you eat uh, has a big impact on the way your brain functions. So it's not just has an, you know, it doesn't just have an impact on the way your body functions, but also the way your brain functions. And so this, um, what I'm talking about here is a study that was kind of the culmination of two decades of work by colleagues at University College London who were studying the impact of selectively um, uh, reducing the amount of certain amino acids, okay, in the diet. Uh, and the impact of that on chemicals in your brain. So all the big chemicals in your brain that are really important for reward and for uh, mood and for learning, so dopamine, serotonin, nor epinephrine, all have to be made from amino acids that you get from your diet. And so after your overnight fast, after you've slept for your three, four, six, eight hours, you wake up in the morning, you're depleted of these uh, amino acids. And so the first thing that you eat in the morning, right, is going to strongly shape the chemicals that are available in your brain, okay? And so uh, it turns out that if you give somebody a shake, quote unquote shake, that is low in tryptophan, then you will have low serotonin levels in your brain. If you give somebody a shake that's low in tyrosine, they will have low dopamine levels in their brain. And in this study, they didn't just give them a kind of manufactured cocktail, but in fact, they just asked people, what did you eat for breakfast? You know, from the spectrum, from cereal, like Lucky Charms man back there, over to, uh, you know, eggs and bacon, the full-on, uh, you know, American breakfast. And what they found was that people who had a high-carb breakfast, their brains were low in dopamine. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, so low dope, so, and in this study, they tested the impact of what those low dopamine levels did, and that the, the people who had, who had eaten high-carb breakfast were more likely to reject fair offers in negotiation, they were more aggressive, uh, and, and they're they also impaired in learning. And so this is like, it seems to me like if you're going to do anything, as a, if you were an institution, right, uh, you are a company, man, I would make sure everybody who's working there uh, is eating a, a nice, healthy, well-rounded uh, breakfast, not, you know, not binging on Lucky Charms or, you know, bagels or whatever else might be out there. And also, I think this has big implications in terms of policy for, uh, for education, for schools, right? Kids who are, you know, if they're coming to school and they haven't eaten or they've eaten only Lucky Charms, you know, is it any wonder that they're failing uh, all day, right? And so with that, um, you know, I don't need to read these to you, so we've taken a tour through uh, the importance of social connection for human, um, you know, human success and uh, some of the ways in which our brains are specialized for this, and, and also accounted for some of the variation across people. If you're interested in this, um, in these questions and others, uh, we offer at uh, the Wharton Neuroscience Initiative uh, executive education, okay? We have an open enrollment course, for example, in May. Uh, we ran it last year uh, to a lot of success. That takes a deep dive over the course of four days. What do you need to know about neuroscience? How do you measure brain function? How do you change it? And then we go through a whole bunch of different applications. A lot of them are on the management side, okay? So we really take a deep dive. Uh, but we also look at marketing, brand strategy, finance, et cetera. And so if you're interested, uh, please take a look. And you can always go to our uh, website, uh, which is sort of one-stop shopping for information about neuroscience and its, um, and its intersection with business. Okay, so with that, thanks. And thanks for the invitation, Jonathan.